It is a, I said to myself, this would never happen to me. And it happened to me. <laughs> uh, it is definitely a privilege and an honor to um, stand behind the pulpit of a New Testament ecclesia and to preach the word of God. Um, it is sobering. I am, um, it's sobering. Um, I don't deserve to be here. I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace and God saw it fit. Um, and so I, I just want to praise the Lord for that. Uh, and keep me in prayer, please. <laughs> you may not see it, but I'm shaking. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so my heart is with the children of this congregation. Um, it has been for a while. I, I, that's, just, that's just what it is. Um, as you look around, as, we, as church exits, <laughs> you just hear them coming up the stairs. You see them just fill the, uh, the foyer and the fellowship hall. And it's just such a blessing. Um, and it's, it's a, when I see it, I'm constantly reminded of the Old Testament. Um, the Lord said that the Old Testament is, is kept for us as, as an example. And we see what happens when, um, when we're not faithful in um, doing what the Lord has called us to do. And so because of that, um, I, w- I really wanted to tie in children with this message. And as I started to uh, develop this message, uh, it didn't seem like, like that was going to happen. And the Lord was gracious to me. So, <laughs> so I appreciate him for that. All right. So to start, <clears throat> I'm going to start reading because I'm nervous. And as I get more relaxed, I'll look up. Um, So introduction. So given the theme of missions for this month, the focus of this message this evening will be to give, will be to examine the word evangelist. Um, To help us build a biblical understanding of this word, we will be examining how this word is used throughout scripture. So to to effectively come to a biblical interpretation of this word, um, we will have to apply proper hermeneutics. Um, So One of the, as Brother Steve mentioned last Sunday, um, one of the techniques that we're going to be using is the principle of first mention. So the principle of first mention states um, that in order to understand a particular doctrine, we must first find the place in scripture where the word is is first revealed and study that passage. Um, The reason behind that is typically um, at that location is where the simplest and the clearest presentation of that word of doctrine is presented. Um, So, to fully understand an important complex theological concept, Bible students are advised to employ this technique. So we're going to spend most of our, so the crux, most of our time will be spent in Acts hmm, Acts chapter 8. So put a marker in Acts chapter 8, and then (laughs) Acts chapter 21, verse 8, Ephesians 4.11, and 2 Timothy 4.5. So these are the verses where we see the word evangelist mentioned. Um, The first mention of the word evangelist is in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. So we'll focus, so we'll focus there first. So let's turn to Acts chapter 21. Okay, so let's start in verse 7. So we read, And when we had finished our course from Tyre, this is Paul, we came to, to um, Ptolemus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day we were at Paul's, we, and the next day we that, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and entered unto the house of one, unto, in, into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode and abode with him. Um, so the first, the first mention of this word evangelist um, that we find in the scriptures is here, in in Acts chapter twenty one verse eight. Um, but we don't get much from. From this verse, we don't get much from the chapter at all regarding Philip. Um, 
what so what we do find is um oh sorry what we do find is after f check is um following verse eight verse nine states that um and the same man who was philip had four daughters had four daughters virgins which did prophesy so what we what we're able to glean from this from this first presentation of the word evangelist is that um, it describes a man. And when we look at the word evangelist in the lexicon, the, it's, it is presented as a noun. So the word evangelist is describing a person, place, or thing. In this case, because of our context, it's kind of obvious that that person or the noun is Philip. So Philip is, is who we're going to start to look at to kind of understand what is an evangelist and the doctrine behind it. Um, so, um, let's take a look at Philip. Let's, let's start right here in, in Acts 21. So we see that, um, Philip is called an evangelist and that he was one of seven. As we go through this, as we go, we're not going to do it for the sake of time, but as we go through Acts chapter 21, um, we're going to, we're not going to find how or where that seven is, is coming from. Um, so we will take that, um, write it down on our notebooks, our mental notebooks, and then, um, and then we're going to continue to see what else we can pull out from the scripture. Um, so verse 9 says, And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So we find out that he's a father, um, and he has children. And as a father of children, um, these children prophesied. That's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so that, that tells us that he is, he's an individual who has raised godly children, at least thus far. And so I submit that's the first characteristic that we can see of, of, um, of someone that is an evangelist, that this is an individual who has, who's able to rule his home well, and not just his home, by extension, his children, right? His daughters, and what I found interesting is that his daughters are virgins, as to say this is not typically the case. So that's, that's, that's very interesting. I was like, hmm, Lord, why did you, why is that there? Um, so yeah, so we find out that he, he is a father of children, faithful children that are serving the Lord. Um, so at, at this point, <laughs> I got, I got sort of pricked, right? And um, I guess the, the question, the question rose up in me. Um, what kind of steward am I being? with the reward that the Lord has given me. Um, if you turn to Psalm 127, we'll look at verse 3. So now I chose this word reward for a reason. Um, We read in Psalm 127, starting at verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage, an inheritance, something that is passed down um, of the Lord. So the Lord is the one that gives us the, inher the heritage, or the inheritance, which is our children. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. So that was interesting. Like, what, is, what do you mean, Lord? So when I, when I study... <laughs> I'm always asking God, what do you, what do you even mean? Like, what is it? <laughs> God, help me. <laughs> I need it. Um, so as you look at the, the word reward, it's interesting because it's, it's a, it means payment of contract. It's a salary or a fare. As if I've done some sort of work <laughs> to earn this reward. I look at my children, I'm like, I'm blessed. I say, Father, I'm blessed. Thank you. I don't deserve them. Um, I, I look at our children. I'm just like, man, they're going to preach. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was pricked. How, how have I been with the reward that, that God has given me? Can it be said of me or of us? Um, that our children put forth to others, prophesy the words of God. Um, 
you just, sorry, Ava. <laughs> um, but listening to her, to her prayer request, Brother Dalton has a reward. She's, I would say, putting forth the gospel, the words of God to those around her. Right? So these daughters of, of Philip, when they prophesied, they prophesied to who? Not to themselves, but to the people around them. Right? They gave the word of God to them. So let's consider that. Let's take that challenge. All right, so following Acts chapter 21, um, so after we dig into Acts, to Acts chapter 21, we find that um, thus far the information that we have on Philip is insufficient to properly come to, an, to the biblical interpretation of what an evangelist is. But we do have some, some characteristics that we could put in our bag um, as we carry along. So, so now from here, we, we start to dig in some more, and we find out, and we look to see what else can we, how else can we start, how else can we investigate? Um, so we looked up the word evangelist, that, that led us to, to Acts 21. So next, the, the, the only person, the only thing left here is Philip himself. So where is Philip first mentioned? So we're applying, we're applying again the uh, principle of first mention. So now we're going to turn to Acts chapter 6. So we're going to start reading in verse 1. <clears throat> and in those, so it reads, verse 1, And in those days, the number of the disciples were multiplied. There, and in those days, when the, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. This, these are the Grecian Jews in, and the Hebrew Jews in the Jerusalem New Testament church because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The twelve called the multitude of the, of the disciples unto them and said, it is, not reason, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look, unto, look, look ye out among you seven men. So, first, we see that the apostles... The apostles charged the church with the work of finding these seven men. What are the characteristics? What are the characteristics of these seven men? And mind you, well, maybe this is a spoiler, but this is the seven of whom Philip is associated with. Um, so, verse three: Wherefore, brethren, look look ye out among you seven men of honest report. That word, honest. That word honest, interesting, so the phrase honest report, interestingly enough, um, the word behind that is martyr, mar martoteo, um, and it means to be a witness. So these individuals were to be a martyr. That's kind of interesting. And guess where we get our word martyr from? This word right here, martoteo. Um, excuse me. The root word of martyrteo is where we get our, our word martyr from. So, so these men were to be martyrs, witnesses for the Lord. Um, secondly, they were, to be, they were to be full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So we find two more characteristics that are associated with this man, Philip, who was an evangelist. So we can say thus far that an evangelist is someone... Who has, faith, who has faithfully raised up children or is raising children, um, is a witness, right? And, is, and has shown the characteristics and has shown to be full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. So, after digging through this, um, as we read the rest of the chapter, we don't see much, much else of, um, of Philip mentioned. So we must continue to find out where else can we, can we build um, doctrine of the evangelist that is 
of the word evangelist that is associated with, with, um, with Philip. So this takes us to Acts chapter 8. So in Acts chapter 8, so for the sake of time, we will not read through the, whole, through, through the chapter in its entirety. But what we will find is that the chapter is replete um, with mention of Philip. And many of his deeds are captured here. So as we begin to look, so I'm just going to take this moment to, um, to sort of summarize what we find here um, in Acts chapter 8. So as the chapter opens up, we find the diaspora or the, the movement out of the church from Jerusalem. And all but the apostles, and maybe a very few, leave Jerusalem and, and spread out. They are scattered. So as Christ ascended to heaven, so let's remember that as Christ ascended to heaven, he, he instructed the church in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, which they did. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. That word witness, that word witness is the root word um, martyr, which is the root word of the word of the two words on this report that we found in um, in the chapter before. So, so they were told to be witnesses, um, both in Jerusalem, which they were, in Judea. Didn't happen yet. And in Samaria, didn't happen either. So they were instructed by Christ to go south, north, and then to the world. But they didn't do that. So God, <laughs> in, in his infinite wisdom, after the death of Stephen, allowed persecution to enter into the church of Jerusalem. And through this persecution, um, the Great Commission begun, um, to some degree. So, we find that we find that Christ we find that Christ had charged his church. Um, this church was made up of saved individuals, Baptists, individuals that followed the doctrine of John. Um, so, what is this doctrine of John? John the Baptist. Uh, so, let, if we go to Mark chapter one. We're going to look at so let's start at verse 1 <clears throat> the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of God as it is written in the as it is written in the prophets before as it is written in the prophets behold i send my messenger before thy face which shall prepare thy way before thee the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord Make his path straight. Verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So this is the baptism. So this is the so this is the the doctrine that the so this is the doctrine that the witnesses in the church of, of Jerusalem were supposed to preach and teach. We find in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So I'll start in verse, yeah, verse 38. So verse 38 starts after the, uh, the message of, of Peter, after, after, after the spiritual baptism. Um, so we, we read, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall have the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see that these, here we see that um, these individuals were to be baptized with the same, with the same baptism that John did baptize, um, which is the same baptism that Christ associated himself with. Um, and that baptism 
um, preach the gospel. Um, and for, the, for those of us that don't know, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was God, for our sins. God literally came from heaven, took on the form of man, walked the earth for 30 plus years for the sole purpose of dying. And that death was to take away um, to take away the sins that I committed. God didn't do it. <laughs> These sins were not committed by God. Um, they were committed by me. And the price that was paid for that was not by me. It was by him. It's not fair. But nevertheless, that was the price. And, um, and we know that the scripture says that uh, he went willingly. Um, it's, it's just hard to, it's hard to consider. Nevertheless, um, our Savior, our God, went and he died and upon the repentance of my sin, meaning there was a day that I, that God struck me, um, my heart was pricked. Well, the God didn't strike me that day. Let's, let me rephrase that. <laughs> um, God, God was working on me continually. Um, I've heard the gospel a few times. But um, maybe unlike many of you, I rejected it several times. <laughs> um, nevertheless, the Lord is gracious. And um, that grace in which he imparted onto me manifested, manifested, it <coughs> manifested itself in time. I still had breath in my lungs. I still was running around, playing with my friends, living my life, living my best life. But God kept working on me. And um, one day I sat on the preaching of uh, <laughs> another preaching, <laughs> and um, he just he just sniped me. The message um, had I don't I don't know how, but it had to do with onions and peeling back the layers of an onion. And somewhere in there, the gospel was presented, and it just hit me. I'm like. I'm going to die and go to hell, and I and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I don't want to diverge too much because time is ticking. But I, growing up in a, in a home with Caribbean parents, <laughs> there was a lot of superstition in our in our. There's, there's a lot of superstition in our culture. Um, there's a lot of witchcraft and dark arts. And by the grace of God, my parents were saved. Um, <clears throat> and I grew up listening to, a, to cassettes of preachers from where my parents came from and how they left those dark arts and served God. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this subject. Um, but cassette after cassette after cassette after cassette, we had a lot of cassettes. <laughs> um, one theme that uh, just was just hammered into my mind, God is power. God is power. Meaning, um, these individuals, they sought power. They sought control. They wanted to um, impose their will on whatever they wanted to get, whatever they wanted to get. Um, and when they could not do that, and when there was a price to pay because of that, um, they had no one else to turn to but to God. And they cried out to God to save them from the situation that they were in, the situation that would have cost them, most likely, their lives. And they knew where they were going. There was not a doubt in their mind. Where I'm from, it's either black or white, God or Lucifer, Satan. Um, these people are not blind. Um, 
And so because of that, um, they're well aware of, of God, of, of the gospel and its saving power. And so that's what I grew up on. And understanding that I don't have what it takes to fight God, right? I can't do what I want to do in my life, <laughs> right? Live my best life and then fight God on my way to heaven. I was like, I have two choices. Repent, <laughs> believe the gospel, which I believed, and cry out to be saved, or die and go to hell. And so, um, so that day, I repented. I gave up the things that I wanted. I said, Lord, I, don't, I no longer want to sin against you. Right? I changed my mind about, there was a change in mind. Right? I no longer wanted to serve self and, and live my best life, which meant sinning against God. I was like, that's bad. That's not good. I don't want to do that. I want you. I want salvation. Christ, save me. And from that day on, I was a new creature. Um, <laughs> from that day on, as our, <laughs> as Brother Vargas mentioned, <laughs> I was a dead man walking. <laughs> and so I say all that to, um, to illustrate that I grew up in a home where the power of God was preached. Um, the power of God was was held in high esteem, um, and that my p- my parents were a witness. Um, they were martyrs. They were they were testifying of the Lord, um, if whether they knew it or not. They were witnesses, um, and they were teaching me <laughs> what a witness looks like. And so I ask you, um, are you that same example? Are you a witness? to your children, um, can they look at you and say, dead man walking? (laughs) What have you imparted onto them? We know that um, in Isaiah, if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 43, I really love Isaiah. Um, (laughs) There are some passages in Isaiah that just I just shake you. So in Isaiah 43, verse 10. By the way, little tidbit. I sit on the preaching of this church. Um, and the pastor of our church, he's always saying, the children of Israel were the witnesses of God. I'm like, where? Where does it say that? <laughs> and during this process, God answered that prayer. <laughs> so, <laughs> verse 10 says, <laughs> emphatically, <laughs> ye are my witnesses. Do I want to say it there? Yes. Ye are my witnesses. Um, the Lord's, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. And my servant, whom, who I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed. Mm. Neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no Savior. That's beautiful. Um, I have declared and have saved and have showed and have showed when there was no strange god among you just pause right there for a second so he's speaking to the children of Israel and he's saying when you were an idolatrous right so now i read this and i say to myself i'm still sort of idolatrous right obviously sanctification is a work in progress i stand before you as a work in progress as probably many of you. <laughs> um, but this is, he's just, just so, these words are just sweet. Um, when there was no strange God among you, therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. So when I die to self, when I fall into martyrdom, what, what, did, what did 
but it, Miss Addy just, <laughs> just, uh, just, I mean, I, I'm not gonna, what's the word I'm looking for? The prayer request. Um, I hear what she did, speaking to some strange dude on the phone and saying, yeah, there's something that you could do for me. I'm like, I, 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 Lord. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm reproved. Praise the Lord, it's just a reproof and not a chastisement. Um, because that's what, that's what I should be doing, right? Um, so at that moment in time, when I don't do those things, I'm idolatrous, right? I am not being a witness of the Lord. I am not dying to self. All right, let's go to chapter 44. We're going to look at verse 8. <coughs> and we're going to read, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee that, have, have I not told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. <laughs> they are their own witnesses. They see not, mm, they see not, nor know that they may be ashamed. So the Lord is the only God. There are no idols that can claim his nature or characteristics. So, <laughs> as the scripture says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God. If you're saved, you're his. Be a martyr. So, in these passages, what I find pretty interesting, or when I read these passages, what comes to mind is, um, is Egypt. And how it's an example of the Lord using Israel to be his witness. Um, we also can look at um, Jericho as well. Right? We find that as, as Israel, um, what did, I forget the verse, but we find, <coughs> we know that Jericho had, that Israel had a testimony before Jericho. Um, how do we know that? Rahab told us, right? Rahab told us about, about the fear in the people because of, of the things that God had done for Israel. So we ought to be witnesses, faithful witnesses of the Lord. And I'm going to move a little quicker. Um, and in Deuteronomy, so we're going to go to Deuteronomy 11. So we are not so we, us, the parent, us individuals right now that are in this room, those of us that are saved, we are not the only ones that are to be witnesses. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, go to verse 16. We read, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. That's for me. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven. And then he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield no fruit unless he perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these, my words, in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be frontlets between your eyes. And ye, me, us, those of us that are saved, that are in this New Testament church, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
So the, the New Testament, as we read the New Testament, we find that the Old Testament is given to us for an example. And this is an example of what we should be doing. Um, if we go to Judges chapter 2, we find the price that is paid. Um, we find the consequences of not doing that. Judges 2, verse 10 through 13. <coughs> I'm just going to start reading because I need to make up time. <laughs> um, verse 10 reads, <coughs> And also all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and those and there arose. So this is the generation of Moses, Joshua, the ones that crossed over, um, that, that came into Canaan. Not the parents that died in the wilderness, but those that came into Canaan. Um, and also all the generation, and also all the generation that were gathered unto their fathers, and those and and also all the generations were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them. So let's put ourselves in this uh, in this verse. So there arose another generation after us, which knew not the Lord nor the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook, and they forsook the Lord, God, and they, and they forsook, they forsook the Lord, God, of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. So, that's a blessing, Right? He brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. So these are the same gods that in Isaiah um, is mentioned to be nothing, to be just wood, to be mute, to be deaf, um, to have no eyes, to have no sight. So these are the gods that these children who, <laughs> who should have been taught of Jehovah and his mighty works that he's done for for their parents and for the generations before and they were not and they fell into idolatry so if we are not faithful in being consistent in doing the work of teaching our children of the Lord this is what we have to look forward to there's a lot of kids here about <laughs> this church a lot of kids I think they outnumber us <laughs> two to one at least <laughs> Um, so that's a, that's a lot of judgment coming. And we've seen from the kings, from, from <laughs> Kings and Chronicles, um, typically when you start bad, you end bad. It's just complete. Um, in the northern kingdom, king after king after king after king after king, not one was good. Do you want that for your children? Do you want that for your generation? Is that, is, that, is that okay with you? No. So let's be faithful. All right. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time here, um, but that's where my heart is. So, um, so let's be faithful in that challenge in teaching our children to, um, to know the things of the Lord. So moving on. So during the diaspora... Um, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Um, so as we go through this chapter, um, Acts chapter 8, um, let's see what can be described about Philip, the evangelist. So I'm going to go quickly. <laughs> we find that, number one, Philip was, so I'll read, I'll speak, you can read and follow along. In Acts chapter 8. So we find that Philip was sent, um, and he made a habit of responding to the Holy Ghost with the authority of the church, obviously. Um, so the, the church who had the authority sent Philip. Um, in, in the previous chap previously in Acts, we read how they prayed. Um, and long story short, there, there are verses in the New Testament where you're, that illustrate the Holy Ghost working in the New Testament church to help them make decisions. Um, 
And Philip was, was one of the individuals that was chosen to be sent out by, by the church in Jerusalem. So we find that Philip made a habit of responding to the Holy Spirit. Um, I kind of want to say something here. Um, so let's. So the, the head of our the head of our teaching department here <laughs> um, went to all the men of the church and asked them, um, "Can you preach? Did you answer that call? Did you fumble? Did you did you uh, do you find did you find yourself in the steps or in the footsteps of Moses?" Um, so let's make a habit of responding to the um, responding to the call of the Holy Ghost. Um, number two, um, so Philip, um, where he was sent, he preached the gospel. So Philip was a preacher of the good news. Number three, we also find that Philip had an understanding of the scriptures and was able to expound them onto those that were sent, onto those that he was sent to preach to. Um, we see this in, in Acts chapter 8 as he encounters the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, the eunuch has Isaiah open. And he goes through this, the verses, and, um, and then he says, he has a question about the scripture, and Philip explains that to him. Um, so as an evangelist, we ought, we ought to know the word. Um, we ought to have the ability to expound upon it and, and uh, so that it can be understood. Number five. Um, <laughs> well, sorry, number four. Um, we find that as, as, um, as Philip preached, Philip the Evangelist, as he preached, people got saved. Um, and after they got saved, they got baptized. And after they got, and after they got baptized, um, a church was started. Now, you sit on the preaching here, so we, most of us do. <laughs> um, so if, you, if you've been here for any period of time, you would know that um, the only entity in the New Testament that has the authority to baptize is a New Testament church. So if Philip was baptizing, he was baptizing under the authority of the church that sent him. Who is that church? That would be Jerusalem. So Philip was baptizing people under the authority of the Jerusalem church. And as more and more got baptized and, um, and the Holy Spirit saw it fit, a church was started in Samaria. And so this, is, this leads us to the next point, which is church planting. So we see here that an evangelist also is a church planter as well. So, so from Acts 21, verse 8, we find that an evangelist demonstrates these five characteristics aforementioned. Um, but this is not the only place this word is used. Um, we also find this word evangelist used in Ephesians 4.11. Um, so in Ephesians 4.11, I'm just going to go quickly. So Ephesians 4.11 reads, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So as you examine the, the word evangelist there, um, you see that it is, for the sake of time, um, that these individuals, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, were all given for the perfecting of the saints, the working of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, as you go through Acts chapter 8, as you look through and investigate the um, Philip in, in the following verses in which we have, um, you see that Philip fulfills these roles, fulfills, um, fulfills these roles, right? He, was, he perfected the saints um, in the church. My assumption is that he would have taught in the church that was started at Samaria, because who else could have, <laughs> right? Um, he did the work of the ministry. That's self-evident. His testimony, his testimony sh shows that he went out, he preached the gospel, um, he baptized people, and then he started churches. I would submit all that falls into the work of the ministry. And also he edified the body of Christ. Um, so we see that the purpose of the evangelist was, f I already mentioned that. Um, so we see that Philip fulfills all these, all these purposes, all these purposes. So I submit that we can conclude the uh, the um, yeah so that we can so I will submit that thus far we can conclude that Ephesians four eleven and Acts chapter twenty one verse eight all describe Philip 
who has been doing um, the works mentioned in Acts chapter 8, which describe him as an evangelist. So the works done in Acts chapter 8 describe what an evangelist does, and I would say probably is. Um, our last verse for the evening is 2 Timothy um, 4 verse 5. So we find that, um, so 2 Timothy 4 verse 5 says, But watch thou in all, so this is Paul to Timothy, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So this chapter in 2 Timothy starts with a charge. Um, I did not read it, but you guys can read it for yourself. It starts with a charge, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, 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 exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Um, following that charge, we are given the purpose. We are given the purpose for it in Second Timothy, um, in Second Timothy four three verse four. Um, our verse is set. In, our verse Second Timothy four five is set in contrast to the attributes that are presented in three verse four. We are in contrast to those. We are to watch in all things. I want to get into the words, but I'm going to be sensitive of time. <laughs> so we are to watch in all, we are to watch um, thou in all things. We are to endure afflictions. Um, I will get into this one. So endure an affliction means to undergo hardship. Um, you're you're going to suffer. Um, but that's what we're called to do. We're called to die to self and as Christ suffered, um, We should expect the same. Um, do the work of an evangelist. So what is the work of an evangelist? Um, I submit to you that is, what, that is what has been demonstrated thus far in the previous verses. Acts chapter 21, um, Acts 21, 8, Acts uh, 8, and um, Acts 6. All of these characteristics, I would submit, um, help develop what the work of an evangelist looks like and what the work of an, of an, of an evangelist is. And I would say primarily Acts chapter 8. So, given the challenge to do the work of an evangelist, I ask you, is this in your heart to do? Are you motivated to keep the commandment of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do the work of an evangelist. We are told that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. So, I ask myself, you could ask yourself, um, Lord, do I love you? Uh, as I consider that, I think of Peter <laughs> three times, right? Christ said to him, do you love me? And on the third time he says, and on the third time he says, you know I love you, phileo, not agape. And nevertheless, he tells him, feed my sheep. So Peter does not love Christ as Christ loves Peter. Nevertheless, Peter is usable. He goes and does the work. Will you be, will you do the work? Um, so yeah. So to close, I say, I challenge you to examine your heart. Is it a heart of stone or a heart of flesh? Read Isaiah. Um, is it a heart for the Lord or for the things of this world? And considering these things, what sort of example are you setting for your children? What kind of Christian <laughs> will they be? We are told, I don't have the verse here, um, Hosea, Hosea chapter 8, oh, sorry, Hosea chapter 4. Oh. This, this, uh, this verse scares me. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for, not, for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. 
that thou should be no, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thee. I will also forget thy children. That's a strong rebuke. As they as they were increased, so th- as they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on iniquity. And there shall be, and there shall be like people, like priests. And I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their and, and reward them their doings. So the priests were supposed to be an example and teach the people. We see this in, Isa- in uh, Nehemiah 8, 1 through 9. You can read that on your own. It talks about Ezra, the priest scribe, and um, how he taught the people. Um, so are you an example to your children? Are you teaching them? Because like priests, like people, so like parents, like children. So preach and teach to them. Um, it's the work of an evangelist. Preach and teach to them. Um, and show them. And when I say preach and teach, the teaching part is you doing the work. Um, it's not just you being verbal. Um, you know that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a uh, little blunt. Um, the talk is cheap. <laughs> uh, so, so let your feet do the talking. All right. And that I'm going to close. <laughs> All right. Holy Heavenly Father, as I come before thee, I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to stand here behind your pulpit, um, to preach the word. And the Father, I pray that um, that this offering, that this sacrifice is a sweet, sweet savor before thee, Father. Um, Lord, I, I have, all I have is you, Lord. Um, all I want to serve is you. And I, from the time I spent with the people here, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it seemed like that is the same. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you just help us to remember these words that were, that were presented. Help us to apply it in our lives faithfully and consistently, Lord. Um, <laughs> that we may see the wonderful works of God. Lord, I pray and I ask of thee all these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen.